Bar Sessions, the podcast where three philosophers sit down at the end of a long conference day to chop it up at the hotel bar, which, as we all know, is where the real philosophy happens. Welcome back, everyone, to Hotel Bar Sessions. I am Dr. Charles Peterson, one of the co-hosts, and I'm sitting here with the immaculate duo of Dr. Liam Johnson and Dr. Rick Lee. What's up, what's up? (laughs) (laughs) I'm just trying to figure out what immaculate duo means. (laughs) So let's wave over Romulus, our bartender. Let's get some drink orders in and let's get some rants and raves going. Rick, you're up to bat, my man. I actually don't have Rami here because as we're recording this, I'm in Poland. And so I have, let me think of a good Polish name. I have Staszu, <laughs> Stanisław is my bartender. And I'm just going to have a vodka out of the freezer, just a shot of that. And I'm going to nice. choose some Żebrówka, which is a Polish vodka that they put a piece of bison grass in it from the forest on the eastern edge of Poland. And it's really delicious. So I'm having that. What are your rants? What are your raves? They are related. So as I mentioned, as we're doing this, I'm currently in Poland. And my rave is I was for the first time ever on an overseas trip, bumped up to business class. And my God, does that make a difference? Holy cow, those seats lie flat, and I slept like a baby all across the Atlantic (laughs) Ocean. So I'm raving about whatever gods were involved in making it so that I could be in business class. I'm afraid, though, I don't think I could ever go back, or when I do, it's going to be punishment. That's a very expensive rave that you just said. (laughs) How do those peasants do it back there in coach? How do they do it? I don't know. They're tougher (laughs) than I am. And my rant then is airplane travel in general. I really just hate it. I always have. I don't like people in general, and I don't like that many people so close to me. I need more space than that. People just back away and please don't talk to me. So (laughs) I'm ranting about airline travel. All right, Lee, you're up to bat. What's your drink and what's your rant? What's your rave? All right. Today, I think I am going to have an amaretto sour. This is something that uh, I've been really getting into recently. It's not good for me. I do have type 1 diabetes. It is like basically (laughs) Kool-Aid. Oh, my God. uh, Oh, my God. Like Fresca. Fresca has no sugar in it. Oh, really? Yeah. It's diet Fresca. No, no. Fresca has no sugar in it. Ew. Fresca is a sugar-free soda. And they're still able to get that taste without the sugar? That's Thank you so much for the opportunity <laughs> to spread the good news about Fresca has no sugar in it. That is a, that is a, a miracle of modern chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> Fresca, we're still waiting for your call. <laughs> However, Emirates Sours have lots of sugar, so I will have it with an insulin back. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> God. Also, I want to say that last year when Cassandra and I went, well, not last year, but whenever the last year was before COVID, Cassandra and I went on a trip to the Smoky Mountains where, as you probably already know, they have a lot of moonshine distilleries. And one of them makes these really great moonshine soaked cherries. And so I always put that in my amaretto sour. So two backs of insulin, please. <laughs> so, oh <my> God. <laughs> all right. Today, both my rant and my rave this week are super obvious. I am raving about the fall foliage. I actually live near park. I have a really beautiful drive to work. And we're in that kind of two week period where nature is showing her stuff and like well done nature props to you. My rant this week, again, obvious is grading. It is the end of the semester for us, and I hate grading. I have a colleague that used to say, I teach for free and they pay me to grade. And I sometimes <laughs> think that is true of my job. And, you know, in our first season, we had an episode on metrics where, among other things, we talked about grading. But I really want to put a plug right now to both of my co-hosts that we should have an episode on grading. But anyway, yeah, I'm definitely ranting about grading. 
What about you, Charles? What are you drinking and what are you ranting and raving about this? I just returned from a trip to lovely Montreal, which is actually quite beautiful this time of year. And I'm going to have a glass of ice wine. Oh. Is that just wine with ice in it? (laughs) Because I see my fellow white women drinking that a lot. I didn't know it had a name. (laughs) No, that would be called the undergrad. Is what that's called. <laughs> <laughs> so a nice little glass of ice wine, something indicative of our neighbors up north. That's the drink I'm having. Now, rants and raves. Oh, so much, so much to rant about. But today's rant is about Senator Kennedy from Louisiana. Ew. Doesn't he remind you of Foghorn Leghorn? I was literally just about to say that. Why, why, why say boo, sir? Why say? Well, in the midst of his questioning of Dr. Omarova, President Biden's most recent appointee to the Treasury Department, because she is uh, an immigrant, he actually says to her, I don't know whether to call you doctor or to call you comrade. And I just thought, Ugh. first of all, not to McCarthyism, dumbass. But in the formal sense of thinking about it, he's a highly educated person. He is a Rhodes Scholar. He has degrees. And I bet money that coming from Louisiana with his southern accent, as he's moving through these sites of education, he's probably working very hard not to be the stereotype that his colleagues and his faculty and his mentors would assume him to be. He's probably overworking to, to let them know I'm not some hick from Louisiana. But now that he's a senator from Louisiana, he has to play that part of being a dumb ass hick from Louisiana. Mm -hmm. And I think this must really hurt. And I think you wasted so much of your time, so much of your life, so many resources, because you could have stayed home in Louisiana and been that fucking dumb for free instead of getting degrees (laughs) to play dumb. You don't got to pay that much to be that dumb. Baby, that's for free. (laughs) You don't have to pay money to walk away from a library. You were born that way. (laughs) You were born that way. So don't get me started. This could be a whole hour. So that's my rant. My rave is, once again, I'm going to return to to Montreal. There's a mood that I appreciated, and I heard it many times. There's an amazing humility and beauty and working classness about Montreal that I really enjoyed. There's some fantastic things there, great art, there are great restaurants, but it doesn't wear it on its sleeve. As one of the citizens of Montreal said to me, we have fantastic things, but we're just not shiny about it. And that I really kind of appreciate it, right? You can be great, but you don't have to brag about your greatness. You can just let people come in, discover it on their own, and better appreciate that greatness. So for the great people of Montreal, for the beautiful time that I had there, and I hope to see you soon, Montreal. Oui, oui. Oui. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> so this week, it seems that my man Rick is in the hot seat. Rick, what do you got for us? So this week, we are talking about, in general, philosophy from and in and in relation to the global South. And in particular, we're talking about critical theory in the global South. And we're lucky enough this week to be joined by a guest that Lee and I had the chance to talk to. Unfortunately, Charles was in quotes in Canada and was unavailable, but well, that's what my out of office reply says. I'm <laughs> in quotes in Canada. And so this week we're going to be talking specifically about critical theory in the global South. And our guest, who I will introduce in the next segment, is one of the co-principal investigators of a project devoted to critical theory in the global South. Yeah, so let's listen to that interview. It's a great pleasure to have a guest joining us this episode. Our guest is Surti Singh. She is assistant professor of philosophy at Villanova. Lee, I think, has some nice things to say about Villanova. Go cats. (laughs) Also, she has her PhD from DePaul. Go Blue Demons. And despite the fact that she actually wrote her dissertation with me, she seems to be relatively successful in her career. In addition to her teaching at Villanova, she's currently the co-principal investigator of a grant called Extimacies 
critical theory from the global south. Surti has written a lot on critical theory, including Adorno, Benjamin, also Lukács. She's written more widely in aesthetics, including some essays published on Egyptian art because her former position was at American University in Cairo. And so she's back in the U.S. after a long hiatus abroad. And so, Surti, welcome to Hotel Bar Sessions. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here and really looking forward to this conversation. So thanks for having me. And since you just came into the bar, <laughs> Romulus, our bartender, is coming over and he would like to know what you're drinking. Well, uh, considering that it's 1130 in the morning, I still have, you know, two classes to <laughs> teach bourbon. and this, this is going to cut into my lunch hour. So, you know, I think uh, Bloody Mary, something nutritive. Nice, <laughs> nice. Nice call. So, Surti, we brought you on because the topic of our episode is the Global South and you've been co-leading this project on critical theory from the Global South. And so I'd like to begin to ask a couple of really general questions. My first question is, I understand why we've started talking about the global south in terms of there are issues, economic issues, there are social issues. A lot of the global south is dealing with post-colonialism or their colonial past. But why critical theory? I mean, why bring a bunch of grumpy German men to the Global South to analyze that experience? It's a very good question. You know, a question I've asked myself many times while doing this project. <laughs> and in a way, I guess we can start by maybe just thinking a little bit more broadly about what the Global South entails. And it's really not easy to give a singular definition of what the Global South is, mm -hmm. but we can think about it as almost a replacement for what was historically considered the third world. You know, the third world is a term given to the non-aligned countries and countries that had a kind of colonial past, or most of them had a colonial past, like Africa, Latin America, Asia, and so on. And I think that in a sense, the Global South emerged as a term that that seemed more neutral in a way, you know, instead of developing country versus developed country or the core right. and the periphery and so on and so forth. So you have the global south and the global north. And I guess when I was thinking about doing this project, I was confronted with the idea of the global south particularly because I was in the Global South. I was teaching and living in, in Egypt and working at the American University in Cairo. And given my background, which was in Frankfurt School Critical Theory, as you know, I began to think about how these things could come together. So it was a bit more of an organic process because it was coming out of my research interests at the time, but then also this experience of being situated in the Global South and being in a completely different social and political context than where I had taken up critical theory initially, which was in North America. And so the impetus for the project was how can I think about critical theory literally from the global south or in the global south? And, and what does it mean to do critical theory from this vantage point? And so in a sense, when I began to develop this project, particularly in conversation with my colleagues who eventually became co-partners here, it seemed to make more sense to think, first of all, about the Global South in a kind of post-national way. So it wasn't simply about a certain region or a certain country, but it seemed that we were all interested in the idea of the Global South as designating a place where there was a struggle against the impact of capitalism and globalization. And thinking about then capitalism and globalization in this way naturally linked on to the concerns of the early Frankfurt theory and, and their concerns with emancipation, and so on and so forth. Thinking about this linkage also tied into what was going on politically at that time as well. So if I'm thinking back to, let's say, right before the pandemic, when this project started, like late 2018, early 2019, when I was living in the Middle East, that was a period of intense rebellions, revolts, mm -hmm. revolutions, which were really widespread and happening concurrently. And Surti, were, were you living in Cairo during the so-called Arab Spring? I moved there right after. Wow. So I moved there in 2012. And that the Arab Spring was 2011. Right. So of course, there'd been this tumultuous time anyway. But I think in terms of formulating this idea, 
of critical theory in the global south. There was a lot of political action happening at that time and really like deepening crises in the political systems mm. and regimes around the world. When this project started, there were brief protests in Cairo, and this was significant because protests had been completely banned at that time. So there was an enormous risk to undertake any kind of protest. But there was also so many protests happening around the world and revolts and resistance everywhere from Algeria, Bolivia, Colombia, Hong Kong, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon. And so some of these were obviously just kind of sparks and others seemed like they would be more long-term revolutions like in Lebanon, which of course, since then, things have changed drastically. So we were thinking about this decade in a sense as one where there was a rise of social movement in contrast or in clash with these very repressive regimes and authoritarian mm. regimes mm. Um, and brutal regimes. And so how could one understand what seemed to be a global rebellion against these neoliberal regimes? And this, to me, seemed like something that critical theory and, and the Frankfurt School could be very useful mm. to think through. So I guess that's part of it, is that it was a way to rethink critical theory within a particular social and historical moment. So it was less about applying Frankfurt School critical theory in terms of their own particular concerns, specifically developing the 30s, although there's parallels, of course, with the critique sure. of authoritarianism and so on and so forth. But it was really about doing critical theory as critical theory is meant to be done, right? Which is mm. that it should speak to the specific social historical context in which one is working. So in that respect, critical theory became a more plural thing for us, again, rooted in the Frankfurt School, but then also thinking about other trajectories, other critical traditions. Psychoanalysis is a big emphasis for our team and, and the people that I'm working with, but also just more broadly thinking about French theory in relation to critical theory and so on. But of course, this was only one piece of the puzzle. So because we were thinking and living in the global south, there's this whole issue of course, of taking up European culture and European forms of thought within the global right. South. And this is a huge issue within the American Academy about the Eurocentricism of, of Frankfurt School critical theory and their complete lack of attention to issues of colonization, racism, and so on. So this became sort of the next issue for us, right, which was how to think through something like the Frankfurt School in the global South. You said something that resonated with a point Charles made maybe even last season. Uh, so he was pointing out that from the perspective of a thinker like Du Bois or even Fanon to a certain extent, one understands that nobody understands white consciousness more than black folk. And it seems to me that when you were talking about the concern of critical theory vis-a-vis -vis capitalism, both as an economic, but maybe more so as a social formation, do you think it's the case that nobody understands capitalism more than those who became the sort of outsourced proletariat for the Western, Northern, developed world? Right. I think that's a great point. And I think that's part of it. In order to deal with the issue of global capitalism, we need to turn to theories of capitalism and from those that, like you said, understand it best or from the vantage point and from the very ways in which their modes of thinking developed was grappling through the problems of capitalism. So I think that's definitely one aspect of it. But I think also the Frankfurt School itself wasn't a singular movement, right? That even sure. at the time that they were writing, and let's say that they're writing in the North, there were also already struggles in the South that were contemporaneous with the Frankfurt School in terms of national liberation struggles oriented towards overcoming social injustice or the legacy of colonialism. We started to think about, well, what was going on even at the time that the Frankfurt School was writing in terms of right. what was the relation between the North and the South at that time, which, again, if you historicize and contextualize what's going on, you have maybe ideology critique in the North versus, again, more liberation theories in the South. And, you know, what was the relation between them even at that time? So instead of just thinking about this as a purely economic question, of like, let's say the South being underdeveloped or something like this, right? I think somebody like Antonio Gramsci's work on the Southern question sure. became important in terms of thinking about the relations even internally to a nation and the relationship between North and South within what he was talking about, the the colonizing effects of the North on, on Southern Italy and whatnot, right. and how the divide between North and South itself is a construct. And so to think about 
what is south within the north and what is north within the south or what is the problematic that arises when we posit this automatic binary that the Frankfurt School has nothing to say about colonization and vice versa. Certain colonial theories aren't attentive to capitalism and this all might be true but I think this isn't a useful way to think about how theory can be mobilized to address concrete historical conditions. So we were really interested in undoing these binaries. I'm always surprised every time I read it that when Adorno describes what in negative dialectics he calls metaphysical experience, and he gathers these experiences under the sign Auschwitz, he says there are many examples of this, and one that he gives in 1966 is Vietnam. Right, exactly. One of the things that I always struggle with is the renaming of what we used to call the third world to the global south. And I think a lot of people don't know that the third world project was a project originated in what we now call the global south. It was meant to be a positive transnational project that joined mostly Asian and African countries at the time to create an identity and to produce ways of thinking about how to operate in a non-aligned world Often now, people talk about the Global South only in negative terms. And so I'm actually curious to hear what you mean when you say critical theory from the Global South. Because I do think a lot of times, and this is of course true with all oppositional discourses, is that oppositional discourses end up sounding like they're just the negative moment in some greater dialectic. That's really my question, is where in the project of rediscovering or in analyzing or articulating critical theory from the global south, where is the positive move in that? So this project isn't only about Frankfurt School critical theory, right? That's sort of one element of it. But it was really like critical theory from the global south has multiple meanings for us. I mean, part of it is, of course, like I was saying earlier, doing critical theory literally from the global south in terms of just taking up, let's say, a critical theory, specifically in the Frankfurt School tradition over the years, has been a very political act, like holding a conference on Adorno at a time and in a place of extreme repression or authoritarianism itself becomes an act of solidarity or a political act. And that in itself can be a way of doing critical theory from the South. But of course, for us, it also was very important was thinking about the relationship between something like Frankfurt School critical theory or psychoanalysis or whatever modes of critical thought we're looking at in relation to modes of thought that are emerging and did emerge from the global south. For example, my colleague who's based in Lebanon has done extensive work on Lebanese Marxist thinkers writing in Arabic and and what were the problematics that they're thinking about in terms of Marxism and colonialism and how do some of these issues maybe tie up with something that was being developed by Frankfurt school critical theory, thinking about psychoanalysis within the margins, so-called margins, you know, what is the psychoanalytic tradition in Latin America? What is it in the Middle East? And thinking through the work of figures that, again, are thinking from the global south. So one of the figures that was really important in thinking about psychoanalysis in the Egyptian context was an Egyptian psychoanalyst, Mustafa Safwan. He was the first one to translate Freud's interpretation of dreams into Arabic, but also not only worked within the kind of more traditional psychoanalytic scope, but wrote a book called Why Aren't the Arabs Free? Thinking through pertinent Mm. issues to the region, to the global south via psychoanalysis, but again, within a very localized context. And so the idea became for us as well, then what's the relationship between theory or theoretical modes of thinking being developed in the global south, separate from, continuous with, in opposition to the European and North American modes of thought that all of us, to some extent, were trained in as well. And, And this is an interesting project because sometimes you can do something like read Horkheimer and Adorno's Dialectic of Enlightenment and their critique of rationality alongside a thinker that's also critiquing reason, but from a completely different vantage point, right? Or the idea that perhaps there can be alternative modernities, alternative trajectories that are coexisting. And so this became the interesting thing about the project and thinking through these relations between North and South within theory itself or the way in which local thinkers have taken up Frankfurt School critical theory in their own work. You know, there's a lot of talk about decolonizing critical theory 
in the American Academy. And I think this is one form of decolonizing critical theory in the sense that it's been mobilized in different ways by thinkers that are engaged in different struggles, you know, yeah, than, than yeah. perhaps what Frankfurt School was thinking about. So, Sirti, I'd like to take that same kind of question and make it slightly more personal. So you continue to write on Adorno's aesthetic theory, Lukács and Benjamin and so on. Are there elements of your reading of Adorno and other figures in the Frankfurt School that you can point to as having been affected by these conversations you've been participating in about critical theory in the global South? I actually just wrote a piece that's coming out soon with Critical Times on a Lebanese Marxist with my co-investigator of this project, Nadia Bouali. And it's on a thinker named Mahdi Amel. And it's his critique of Said's critique of Marx, and particularly Marx's reading of India. Hmm. And this was the, it's the first time we commissioned a translation of his work. It's the first time this piece is coming out in English. And so the piece will be published and as well some responses that we solicited to the work. And we also wrote some responses. And so to answer your question, when I was reading Mel's critique of Said, I was really struck by how similar his critique was to something like Adorno's critique of identity thinking. And he mobilized ideas of identity thinking, positivism, and even specifying different forms of identitarianism that emerges for, for Amel and Said's thinking that was very, very similar to something like what Adorno would do. And so I took this as an opportunity to think them together a little bit, you know, and introduced some of Adorno's ideas into this piece as also a kind of way to critique some of Amel's critiques of Said. And so this is definitely something that I wouldn't have come to without this kind of excursion through this project and thinking through these figures that are outside of the, the Western canon. I think some of our listeners, I'm optimistic when I put that in the plural, that <laughs> some, some of our listeners might be screaming into their earbuds saying, what do you mean the global South? Right. So is part of this project also contesting a little bit the very unity or identity, one might say, of the global South? Yeah, absolutely. And and to be honest, I mean, this was a term that we really didn't want to use. And, mm. and we sort of needed to use this term in a way. But yes, it's definitely something that risks homogenizing vast regions of the world in the same way that terms like the third world did, you know. And so definitely, yeah. this is part of our approach is to trouble this very notion. So I know we're running up against the end of your time here, and I so appreciate you coming and speaking with us, but what can we look forward to coming out of this project? We have multiple projects on the go. So there's a co-edited volume on the notion of extimacy that I'm working on, as well as this special issue in Critical Times on Mahadi Amo. And our co-investigators are also working on different projects. So hopefully there'll be a number of books that eventually appear. As someone who is kind of a critical theorist himself, I was just really intrigued about the bringing together of social, cultural, political issues in the global south and reaching out to critical theory and expanding critical theory. And it sounds like you're really engaged in a conversation about critical theory, with critical theory, uh, sometimes against critical theory. Right. And so the project seems really, really interesting and exciting. Yeah, I completely agree. It sounds like an absolutely fantastic project, and I'm so glad that you came on to tell us a little bit about it. No, thank you so much for having me and letting me talk about it. It was really great. Hey, listeners, before we have too many drinks and it slips my mind, if you can't catch us at the Hotel Bar, you can catch us on Twitter at Hotel Bar Podcast. You can also follow our HBS hosts individually on Twitter to catch their all-fair thoughts. You can follow Charles at at C underscore F Peterson. And Peterson is with an O, not an E. O, not an E. Rick is at at Rick Lee Philos. That's Rick Lee with two E's and Philos spelled like half of the word philosophy. And Lee is at Dr. Lee M. Johnson. The doctor's abbreviated and Lee spelled L-E-I-G-H. In the off chance that you weren't furiously scribbling notes just in, you can also visit our website at www.hotelbarpodcast.com and find everything you need to know there. Now, back to our conversation. 
So Lee and I had a really great time talking with Sir T. And one of the things that I thought was most interesting about her project, as you could tell, I was really fascinated about what a German dude like Adorno is doing in the global south and what that would look like. But I, I was also really interested in the way she started talking about how philosophers in the global south are talking back to critical theory and not just using it, but also changing it, challenging it, and adding to a larger discussion about what critical theory might mean. And I found that to be really interesting. Yeah, I did too. I think that one of the things that, and this was embedded in the question that I was trying to ask her, one of the things that I worry about a lot when philosophers from the global north engage with philosophers from the global south is that it, it seems as if philosophers from the global north take the theory of Europe and just apply it to situations of the global south or impose upon philosophers of the global south the critical standpoint that ends up, and this is what I said in my question to her, just being the negative moment in some broader dialectic. That was my concern. I, what I really appreciated in her response was that she reminded me of what I shouldn't have needed reminding of because it's the most obvious thing about critical theory is that critical theory starts as a philosophy of liberation. And so in that sense, the critical move is not just a negative move. It's a positive move. What was really interesting to me, and I had forgotten about this, even though I have written about it, was Antonio Gramsci's reflections on the South. And he's talking about the global South. Well, in particular, he's talking about Italian colonies, that the South has kind of a double meaning. It means one thing in the North, that is for Italy itself, but we could extrapolate. And so when someone in the global North says the global South, it means one thing. But we should not prevent the thinkers and workers in the global South from taking up that label as something not just as the negative image of the global north, right. but as something in its own right, something that is, in fact, a challenge to the status quo. I mean, and I like the idea of taking on this positive identity that we see. So, Lee, I really appreciated your mention in the interview that this is not new in terms of how do we begin to think about these former colonial or colonized nations proactively developing a sense of themselves. And when you mentioned that, I thought about, oh, yeah, the Bandung Conference, right, where you exactly. begin to see these newly forming early post-colonial states saying, look, we're just not going to play this battleground for Western capital or for Soviet base or imperial communism, but we're actually going to try and think about what the third way by which we can begin to navigate global politics. Yeah, and that was Lee's important point about the label third world developing from out of the third world itself, not as, you know, we didn't win the gold medal, we didn't win the silver medal, we're just playing for the bronze right now, but rather as you just put it, Charles, we're third in a positive way. We don't want you and we don't want you and we're going our own way. Yeah, and I really wish that we could recapture that use of the third world. I say we and I don't mean we like the global north, but I mean, I, I wish that that positive use of third world could re-enter circulation in discussions of the global south. Because I think what was really great about the Bandung Conference is that we're really being presented with quite literally another vision of the world, a world that yeah. was transnational, that was not participating in the kind of Cold War bipolar power relations, but also a world that is thinking and living and acting from the perspective of the least advantaged. Yeah. I was appreciated that position's broad and clear critique, right? Because it's, it's easy to say, look, we're going to be critical of the West because we have this history, be it the United States as a neo-imperialist or the traditional colonial powers of France and England and so forth and so on. But also to say at that moment, we understand there are some very deep problems happening in terms of how the Soviet Union is approaching us. There's some right. very real questions about their earnestness or their engagement or their sincerity about our liberatory move. And we're going to pause on that as well. I think about 
Amilcar Cabral very brilliantly was able to navigate the politics of Soviet imperialism in the midst of the struggle for, for freedom in Guinea-Bissau. And certainly having an ideological parallel to the formulations of socialism and communism in that society, but at the same time maintaining a political freedom and independence and autonomy and always grounding his ideas and his struggle within the conditions of the people of then Portuguese Guinea, now Guinea-Bissau. That's a, a point, Charles, that I've been thinking about since we had the chance to talk with Surti. Namely, that isn't it bizarre that five, six, eight dudes in Greece or the, the small Greco world at the time are suddenly, or not suddenly, but become just philosophy or universal <laughs> philosophy, right. Right. as if they weren't philosophizing from out of a position, out of a local community. And so what I've been thinking a lot about is, is the way in which a project like the one Surtees engaged in allows all philosophy to be relocalized. But then in an interesting way, the universal gesture is one more of conversation, one more of opening up the kinds of questions we ask, the approaches we take, so that all communities now have something, to borrow a phrase from Castro Gomez, to offer back to the, in quotes, center from the periphery. Here's one of the things that I will worry about, though, and I'm about to be like mega Debbie Downer about this, but... Wah, I, wah. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I do worry, though, that it's in the disposition of philosophers in the Anglo-American world to not see the kind of work that Sartre is doing as positive contributions to philosophy. So to always see, for example, critical theory from the third world as commentators from the third world on the critical theory of the first world. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. quite simply not to be able to see that commentary and that critique and that conversation as itself a philosophy or a, as a reading. I say this because I think I myself suffered from this disposition as well. And to be honest, it wasn't until I started reading Deleuze, not, you know, Deleuze and Guattari, but Deleuze on other philosophers, mm. that I first got the sense that there is a kind of commentary that is itself a, a philosophy, you know, that is positing something and not simply commenting on something. But my worry about this is that there's all this amazing work being done, for example, in projects like Sartiz, and of course being done by philosophers in the global south, but that the change needs to happen in the global north for that to be received in a way that might ultimately make way for a conversation that could be actually liberatory. I have a question about that. And my question is, who are those involved in the conversation who should be involved in the conversation? And as much as I love a lot of these, you know, what we now call post-colonial thinkers, I love the critique. I love the engagement. I love the transformation of the dominant narratives that they are exposed to. I'm always concerned about, well, who are you writing to and who are you writing for? Like, who is your audience? Mm -hmm. right? And so I'm always more fascinated with the idea of can within the global South, as we're using it, should we just be speaking directly to each other? And to what degree should we be incorporating those voices, those thinkers, those perspectives in, quote unquote, the global north? Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a key point for me, because I'm also thinking about this, just not in terms of philosophy, as we're saying it, but I'm also thinking about this in terms of politics, about power in a real world being gathered, appropriated in order to make particular types of changes. I think this links up in interesting ways with Lee's last point, because I wasn't shocked when Sir T said this. I, I, I know a lot of philosophers in particularly South America, Brazil, Peru, who are just taken by psychoanalysis. And I, by the way, I don't like psychoanalysis. I have very serious problems with it as a philosophical approach. Same. But what I've learned from them is that bringing a tool like psychoanalysis to help them understand their own existential, political, and social context actually opens up the texts of psychoanalysis, Freud, Lacan, and others, in ways that someone like me would never be able to open them. 
and that we now see these texts maybe speak to audiences that weren't necessarily their intended audience. This leads me to believe that from my position, I have a lot of listening to do Mm -hmm. and a lot less intervention to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can see that. The listening is important and necessary, but I'm always thinking about, well, who am I talking to across these borders? And maybe these borders within a global south and moving laterally as well as vertically. Mm -hmm. And probably for me, more importantly, to be moving laterally. Like me, considering myself, in a sense, a member of this global south community or this consciousness to some degree, I should be more engaged with those thinkers, with those scholars who are having these conversations more so than I'm directly talking to or reading the texts of the Frankfurt School. There's much in that school that I find important and useful, but how do I begin to immerse myself in this larger global south discourse and conversation? Yeah, and I'm really glad that you said that, Charles, because I think one of the things that Serti noted rightly is that the Global South is not exclusively a geographic designation, nor is it a political or economic, you know, exclusively a political, exclusively economic or exclusively racial designation, that there are many Souths in the North and there are many Norths in the South. And so one of the things I really do appreciate her saying is that when we're talking about the global South, we're not just talking about economically depressed nations or nations living under repressive regimes or former colonies, but we're talking about a constellation of concerns and issues and demands that unite the global South beyond those kind of simple divisions that we might make geographically, politically, economically, et cetera. Yeah, and and following up from that, Lee, she brought up that one of their first challenges was to take on the very notion of the global South and to recognize that India is not Peru and Peru is not Angola and that there are a lot of differences But one thing that I think experientially is shared is the experience of having been, and and I I don't like to coin words, but I can't think of another way to put this, peripheralized, uh, having been put on the periphery. And then there's a certain moment in which a project like Surtees wants to say, all right, you know, fuckers, you put us on the periphery. Now listen to what we have to say. Right, right. This is what I was thinking about is how that shifts and how designations and positions and societies and regions are, though it was probably the intent at the onset of modernity and the erection of these structures of power and dominance, but how in a very large degree, what we're seeing, let's say in China, is the shift away from being seen or designated or relegated to a part of the global South and a move to become, in a sense, a global power moving into, quote unquote, the first tier of geoeconomics, geopolitics, geo-influence, right? So that's an interesting question as well. Like, what does it take? What does it mean? Is this part of a liberatory move on the part of what we see of Chinese authorities challenging the status and, and the hegemony of the United States, Western Europe? What does the BRICS organization mean? Brazil, mm-hmm. Russia, India, oh God, what's the, what's the China, BRICS? China and, and South Africa as well. You know, what does that mean for this type of theorizing? What does that look like in terms of an emancipatory project? You listen to us and we want to hear from you. If you've got feedback, suggestions for future topics, or if you just want to pick a fight with one of our co-hosts, we encourage you to visit www.hotelbarpodcast.com and click on the interactive page, where we often solicit listeners' feedback on past episodes and contributions for upcoming episodes. If you want to hear yourself on HBS, you can always email us a less than two minutes audio clip to hotelbarpodcast at gmail.com. If it's interesting, we may use it. And if it's not, we'll definitely send you our Venmo handles so that you can virtually buy us a drink. Now, back to the conversation. So 
So this has really been an amazing conversation. I, I'm sorry that I was not present for the, the interview with Dr. Singh. I'm enjoying revisiting in our conversation and also going back and listening to the conversation. So I want to throw it back to the man in the hot seat. And, and Rick, what's our takeaway? I don't want to leave without saying, and, and I know she wouldn't mind me saying this, but so Sir T was a grad student at DePaul University, and she got a job at American University in Cairo. And when she arrived in Cairo, she looked around and said, I need to start thinking with and from this place, mm -hmm. that I'm not just going to plop down Frankfurt in Cairo and act as if we're all Germans here. And in conversation with philosophers in the region and artists, she was really involved in the art community in Cairo. She really did let that wash over her thinking that was up until that time all Hegel and then critical theory. And I think there's something incredibly admirable about that and incredibly courageous. And, and I think in a way, she personally provides the kind of model I was talking about, about listening and, and speaking from and with philosophically the place you're in. I also just want to give her and her collaborators a shout out for, I'm not sure if they coined this word or not, but this anthology that's coming out is titled Extimacies. So yeah. like, so mm. it's like intimacies, but extimacies. And I have really sat with that word a lot over the few days since we interviewed her and really tried to myself work through how I even understand a term like that. But I think it's a really fascinating concept. You know, we think about intimacy as being so dependent on closeness and likeness. But this idea of extimacy, that there's a kind of closeness and likeness that might require reaching out, getting out of oneself. That is something that I think is a, you know, what one of my old professors used to call a very pregnant concept. <laughs> <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm the midwife here just waiting for it. <laughs> I got my gloves on. I got the water boiled. I'm ready for it. <laughs> um, forceps. Who's got forceps? Yeah, yeah, right. and, and I'm the spouse waiting in the waiting room smoking cigarettes and drinking. <laughs> And I'll make a final point, and this goes back to what Rick said earlier in terms of Dr. Singh put herself in the context, in a position of these scholars of the Global South when she was at American University in Cairo. And it so reminds me of what, and shout out to Amilcar Cabral again, his whole concept of returning to the source. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? What does it yeah. take, and, and especially for the westernized intellectual, the westernized elite of these spaces, who have been completely shaped and formed by a particular colonial perspective, what does it take for them to shed themselves of this way of thinking about the world? And that means going back to the heart of the people, going back to the cultures, going back to the positions and the perspectives. Because how else can you challenge that model of dominance except to rethink and take on a, a vision and a model of liberation? Nice. Nice. I think Stashu has given us the eye. He, he clearly does not have Rami's patience with our with our elaborations and he wants us to get the fuck out so i think it's last call is passed and i think our day is done with this yeah thanks so much rick for putting us in contact with Surti singh and Surti, if you're listening thanks so much for the interview it was uh it really gave us a lot to talk about yeah thanks Surti. It was, it's been fantastic and i'm looking forward to to listen to this again and again talk to y'all next time later all right everybody have a good one <laughs>